cross, O oh Lord, taught me to see that though I fail you every day, your steadfast love will not fail me, but gladly bears my sin away. And there I see your holy fire consuming sin in mercy's blood. What righteousness and love require to ransom sinners to their God. Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to weep, for there my sin led you away, and in the sun did bow in grief, as darkness crowned our darkest day. And oh, to think that I once stood, indifferent to your suffering, and oh, to see your sweat like blood, such depths of sorrow born for me. Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to love, for there I've tasted love divine. It fills my heart with power enough to make your costly service mine. No sin too great to meet with grace, no enemy too foul to bless. Your love in wounds of sacrifice, teach me, O oh Lord, to love like this. Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to sing, for now my captive soul suffering can tear away your love from me no song can reach such heights of joy no tongue can tell such depths of peace no power no time can ever destroy the eternal praise for Calvary no song can reach such Heights of joy, no tongue can tell such depths of peace. No power of time can ever destroy the eternal praise for Calvary.
regret and ravaged years for all sweet and bitter tears we have a father we have a father for our tracks through burning sands to our home in promised lands this hope of Christ the Lord, a tribe from every land, loved before the world began, our names are on his hands. We were promised long ago to weaken barren hearts, and here we stand as living proof, as countless as the stars We, the people of the cross Our mark of victory For once we wore the chains of sin But now we've been set free We celebrate Suffering King who died to make us one We were the prize and in his eyes the trophy he has won We the church of God the gates of hell will not overcome And we will see his kingdom here on earth as it is Okay, good evening and welcome to our Monday evening celebration here in week three. Um, isn't it wonderful to be able to connect in different ways? So welcome if you're here in the packing hall, in the relay tent, at the Methodist Church, and if you're online watching from at home, it's great to have you with us. And it's been our first full day here at the convention. Robin, how's your day been? Oh, it has been a magic Monday, hasn't it, Cal? It's been great. So I took the kids to the first Families Together morning which is brilliant, loving the Guardians of the Gospel, Guardians of the Galaxy mashup theme. Got absolutely covered in sticky stickers and sticky tape, but it was great. And then the sun came out, so glorious afternoon in Fitz Park. Sounds good. What about you, Kaz? And I've got to ask, after last night, how are you finding being north of Bedford? <laughs> yeah, brilliant. I mean, what is there not to love? Went down to the lake, um, the sun came out, and 360-degree mountains, just beautiful. So yeah, a great afternoon. Thank you. Thumbs up from me. Good stuff. And it's great to hear from you too. Please do send in photos, let us know what you've been up to. And as always, we've got a few um, lovely comments to share with you. So. 
uh, conventioners, Garan and Sue, who attended in week two of this year's convention, uh, say a massive thank you to everyone involved with organising the convention. We did appreciate being able to come and experience the amazing teaching, and the friendly, cheerful, helpful stewards were brilliant. It was a delight to meet so many lovely people with a heart for serving the Lord. Oh, shout out to the helpful and cheerful stewards. Don't hug them this year, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Here's another message we've received. Listen to this. What you have done with the pencil factory to get things ready in time for this year's convention is truly amazing. A young conventioner for many years now, and it's like coming home. Thanks to all staff and volunteers for working so hard. Absolutely. And the next one's a particularly special one. Today in the Post, we received this photo from the 1933 convention from the Routley family um, and a programme from 1935. Um, it was from a lady who's come to the convention for many years and her son wrote saying, my mother's faith was greatly helped by the teaching at her church and at Keswick. She lived to 103, her faith still strong. How amazing. Um, and get this, in the 1935 programme, it refers to being punctual to meetings and to facilitate the work of the stewards by a ready compliance with their instructions. Um, and um, also a reminder to come waiting on the Lord, desiring and expecting blessing to your own soul individually. So there you go. How lovely. Uh, so do keep uh, your comments coming in. And in light of that reminder from 1935, um, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can come to you another day um, in your wonderful creation, another day um, to appreciate your goodness to us. Whether we're feeling weary or joyful, we thank you that your word has authority in our lives. And we pray that you would prepare our minds to listen and our hearts to respond to bring glory to your name. And in that precious name, we pray all of this. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Ollie and Van. Thanks, Kaz. Let's stand to our feet together and, and praise our God. Just want to read something to you from 1 John. This is about God's love to us. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What a wonderful loving God that we get to come to and we get to sing to. You know what? He's not sat up there somewhere, kind of distant, not enjoying our songs, but he rejoices over us with singing himself. He delights in our praise, and let's delight in him tonight together. Here's love. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who is love will not remember. Who can see? Fiction fountains open deep and wide through the flood gates of God's mercy flow to vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured in and from above, and heaven's peace and perfect justice. The guilty world in love. When our hearts are filled with sorrow. 
Jesus gave up. He adopts us as His own. Only by the blood of Jesus could we come before the throne. And now His Spirit has been given to the church that He has won. Let us raise our song of gladness. Praise the Father's
cast my mind. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus went and died for me. I see His His answers me. I see.
all praise, all glory belongs to you, Jesus, God eternal, God forever, God who will come again and take us to be with you. You'll recreate this earth and we will dwell with you forever. We worship you now and we will worship you fully then. Praise you, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, there is loads of great stuff still to come in the rest of this week. Tomorrow, I know that many people are particularly excited about Andrew Peterson's second visit to the Keswick Convention. Andrew is a singer-songwriter from Nashville, amongst other things, and he will be doing a concert tomorrow evening straight after the celebration uh, at 9.15 here in the Packing Hall. Lots of people have been asking about tickets. No booking needed. Just come along. Make sure you are here. This year, we are also holding a special event for the extended families of missionaries to provide additional support to those who have loved ones serving God around the world. So that's going to be the Mission Families Reception, and that's going to take place on Wednesday from 2 till 4 at the Base Camp Cafe. And that's a chance to meet with others and to pray together. And you can see the website on the screen in terms of how you might register. Um, another advance warning for the rest of the week. If you've got um, young people that are at the youth evening meetings, they will finish at 9 p.m. for the rest of the week. Um, and then we've got the chance to hear now from David Sorday. David is Chief Operating Officer at the Keswick Ministries, and he's going to give us an exciting update about the Derwent Project. So over to David um, to hear his news. <laughs> Well, it's a real joy to spend just a few minutes giving a sort of progress report on the Derwent Project. Now, as you know, the Derwent Project was a vision that was cast back in 2010 by the then trustees of the convention, and they really posed two questions. Would it be possible to extend the ministry of the convention to an all-year-round basis? And secondly, would it be possible to bring the convention together all on one site? At that time, the convention was spread all around the town in different venues. The Skiddle site was sort of slightly bursting at the seams. And children's work was, of course, down here at Rawnsley. And it wasn't until 2015, when this site became available, that that vision could become a reality. And in 2021, here we are, all on that site for the first time, all one in Christ Jesus. There's the banner up there. Uh, that came down from Skiddle with us. But of course, we don't want to worship a banner. We want to grow as children of the Lord, both us, adult children, together here, but with our children on the same site, our own children and grandchildren, studying the same text as us, just across the way there in the pencil factory. And that's the first thing that the Derwent Project has really delivered. It's allowed us to secure the future of the convention on one site. But the second thing it's done is extend this idea of all year round ministry. So now there's a, a program of 12 teaching and training events that run throughout the year. Uh, and I'd really encourage you to look on the website and find out more about those courses. There really is something for everybody, both for leaders, but also for the body of the church who want to deepen their walk with the Lord. So do have a look at that on the website, but also there's a special event running tomorrow in the pencil factory with our ministry director, James Robson. It's at two o'clock, and I, again, I'd really encourage you to go along, find out more about those courses, and of course, if you come on a course, you come back to Keswick, so it's a sort of double whammy bonus at another time of the year. But the third thing that the Derwent Project can do is new initiatives, and we've just launched one, which I think is really, really exciting and is already causing a bit of a ripple. It's Church Weekends Away, and it's specifically designed for small churches or groups of Christians within churches who want to go away for a church weekend, but don't really want all the faff of organizing your own weekend. Well, come to Keswick, and we've organized these two events, one in the autumn of 2022 and one in the spring of 2023. We'll organize the sung worship and the Bible teaching, and you can have fellowship with the other churches, but also have breakout time uh, on your, with your own group. So maybe think about that, and we'd love to see you back here with you and some of your friends. But of course, to deliver all those things, 
we need a facility, and that's where the pencil factory comes in. And there it is, the two sides of, of the story, the 2015 picture with the building on the right of the screen looking slightly dilapidated, just been hit by Hurricane Desmond and slightly vandalized, the window's broken. And then on the left of the screen, wonderfully restored as it is now, with the new fascia, the new windows put in, the new rendering, the new painting. And of course, downstairs, those lovely meeting rooms where already youth work and seminars are taking place. But there is still more work to be done. As we go up through the pencil factory, the first floor and the second floor still need to be refurbished. And at the rear of the building, the rendering and the windows still need to be done. And we need some stairs as well. So there's a bit of work to do. We hope that work will be done throughout the next year, starting in October, and be ready for the convention in 2022. But it will cost around £600,000. So I would ask you to prayerfully consider whether that's something you could help support. We have a little video now which really introduces you to some of the people who have been involved with the project from the start and also gives a little bit of an update on the progress that's been made. For 145 years, Keswick Ministries has served the wider church, inspiring Christians from all over the world in their walk with Christ. A few years back, the trustees cast a vision for what we now know as the Derwent Project with the aim to transform this derelict site. It is wonderful to see the progress the Derwent Project is making. The building itself is looking really good and parts of it are already being used for a number of activities. In fact, last year, Emu Music played here. It's especially encouraging to me to see how the vision is becoming a reality today. I'm really excited that even last year, children and youth were able to start to use part of the pencil factory for their program. What an answer to prayer. And it's been fantastic to see all of that begin to happen. I can't wait to see the site packed with Christians from all ages and all walks of life coming together to celebrate the God-given vision, to hear God's word, to become like God's son and to serve God's mission. Over the last year, the Derwent Project has made great progress. Phase one of the refurbishment to the pencil factory building is complete. This involved the rendering, painting and new windows on the front fascia, installation of toilets for use during the convention, heating, lighting and plumbing, and the creation of meeting spaces on the ground floor that this year will be used for the convention's youth program. Over the last five years, what was a vision back then is becoming a reality. It's been incredibly exciting to see. So what was a derelict site is now becoming a striking conference centre available for use. But it's not about a building, it's about transformed lives. And it's incredibly exciting this year for the first time in Keswick's 145 year history to have the convention on this one site. We ran a preaching workshop just in October while it was still allowed and we had uh, 10 young preachers coming. And the person running the workshop said, in that room were 40,000 sermons. So a chance to invest in a few for the sake of the many. One thing that really excites me is working with young leaders as part of the youth team. It's just great to see people coming along and getting involved, stepping out and investing in these kids and realizing that they can do it, that with God's help, they can play their part in seeing lives changed. And of course, they go home uh, equipped with new gifts and skills that they can use back in their home churches. The Derwent Project has such potential to touch so many more lives. And for some, that might mean following in the footsteps of folk like Amy Carmichael and Hudson Taylor, for whom the convention played a significant part in them taking the gospel to thousands abroad. The opportunities are endless. The progress has only been possible through the continued and generous financial support of so many. We have reached numerous milestones and are now about to reach yet one more, which will see the first and second floors of the building completed. In order to reach this next milestone, we will need to raise £600,000 before we can continue. 
So would you consider making a donation of £50 or £100 or maybe even a larger gift towards the project to help us reach this goal? Or maybe you would consider giving a smaller amount on a monthly basis? Each and every gift makes a difference and takes us closer to the point where this and the next generation can enjoy this beacon of spiritual refreshment, a refreshment we all need so much. Thank you. Well, we'd love to show you around the pencil factory, and this week we're running uh, tours every day, one at 1.30 and one at 3.30, so it'd be lovely to see you on one of those. You can sign up on the VKC website, uh, just go there, sign up for one of those tours, and it would be fantastic to show you around and show you some of the refurbishment work that's gone on. Well, the whole Derwent journey has been one of partnership, and it's been so blessed, so we've been felt so blessed by God's people for your generosity, uh, and we would ask um, if you'd be able to continue that journey with us. Uh, we'd love um, you to do that. Um, these brochures are available, I think they're on your seats, but also at the back and they have all the details of the Derwent project in there and the ways that you can both prayerfully support us but also maybe financially as well. So please do continue the journey with us. Thank you. Evening, everybody. I'm always on the lookout for a really good missionary story, a missionary biography or autobiography, especially when times are hard to be encouraged uh, as you see God's hand on people's lives and how he uses them. Uh, this uh, last year, probably about four months ago, I read what I think is the best modern day biography I've read for the last couple of years. It's really outstanding. It's called Counting the Cost. It's the story of four missionaries who they regularly were going to the Niger Delta, but they are captured at gunpoint and held for a ransom. And this is, it's not just an amazing story, it's well written, it's a page turner, but it shows how God, even in suffering, even in struggle and this desperate situation, how God brings about his purposes, how he brings about good even from terrible circumstances. Uh, I laughed, I cried, I, uh, I gasped, particularly at the gunpoint bit, um, uh, which you won't now gasp at because you know about it. But uh, I think it also this, this, this story is so rich in theology as it's been worked out. This isn't just head knowledge that they've gained from, from Bible college, but this is living out everyday sacrifice for the Lord Jesus. Uh, if, you, if you like a good story that's going to encourage you and challenge you, get this book by all means. It is superb. I really commend it to you. But of course, as people go out on the mission field, as we share our faith with our neighbours and our friends, our family, it always takes sacrifice. It's not easy to share our faith with those uh, wherever they are in the world, wherever we find ourselves. And Simon Gilbo, who's a, a um, missionary in one of the, the poorest areas of the world, has written a little book based on the verse in Romans 12, where it says, in view of God's mercy, I urge you, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, because this is holy and pleasing to the Lord, and it is your act of worship. So for each one of us, what, what does it look like to sacrifice, to worship God? This little book it is a hard read. It really is, not because of its length, not because there's long words in it, because it challenges each one of us to lay down our lives for the sake of Christ. Can I challenge you to read this little book and see what sacrifice you and I need to be making in view of what God has done for us as our act of worship to him. You can get the biography for six quid. This is just a couple of quid. Buy the two together. You can have this one for a pound, seven quid. This cost is not sacrificial. Reading these books, well, we are gonna pray that as each of us read them, God might just change our lives to be about his work, however sacrificial. Brilliant. Let's stand again. My shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He 
leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul, and I will trust in you alone. And I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. He guides my ways in right. Trust in you as well, and I will trust in you as for your endless mercy. seconds where you are, just pause, just be still, just reflect where you are for a few seconds. Lord, we say that we trust in you and you alone. Keep our hearts wanting to rely not on ourselves, but on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we've got Colin White joining us this evening. He's going to be reading the Bible for us in a moment. And um, Colin's on the youth team this week, um, but in normal life, he's assistant pastor at Long Crendon Baptist Church um, in Buckinghamshire. Um, welcome, Colin. So, um, Colin, you've been on some of the year-round training events that Ken uh, Keswick Ministries put on. Uh, one of them we heard about in the video is the preaching workshop, and the other one is the faith in the second half of uh, sorry, faith in the second half of life training. Um, can you tell us a little bit about them and how they've been a blessing to the ministry that you're involved in? Sure, yeah. The, um, the, the preaching workshop was, was really a, a blessing and a benefit to me just to week to week working through God's Word and making it alive and compelling uh, to people. Obviously, it is in itself, but doing that in a manner which is dynamic and, uh, yeah, just being a bit more uh, vivid in illustrations and things like that as well. 
I think the other part of it, the, the seniors ministry, obviously through lockdown, um, that has been a challenge, being able to pastor and minister to people uh, who are uh, later in years. And so being able to, to look after them, and love them, serve them well, that's been a really helpful course. Brilliant. Well, let me pray for us as we open up God's word. Dear Lord, we thank you for your precious word and the freedom to be able to read it and hear it preached. Help us now to be focused and free from distraction so that your word has a lasting impact on our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This evening's reading comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Well, hello, it's a delight to be with you all this afternoon. Can I uh, pray one more time uh, as we come to God's word? Loving Heavenly Father, we delight in you, our God. You loved us first, and now our hearts are yours. We pray that by the power of your spirit, we would want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, so that what we say with our lips, we would do with our lives that for the joy set before us, we would endure the cost of proclaiming Christ. And we pray in his great name, amen. I wonder if you ever feel like in the game of life, you are losing. I wonder what games you play uh, at our uh, house. There's all kinds, there's Minecraft, there's Candy Crush, there's tennis, there's all kinds of games going on uh, with our four children and so on. But if life itself were a kind of game, do you ever feel like you're losing? Perhaps you, you look around and you see other people who clearly seem to be winning. There's comfort and health and relationships. There could be many answers, but do you ever feel like perhaps you're losing out on the game of life? Well, Christians are called to live a life that means we often look like losers. And if you ever feel like that, then there is real comfort for you here today. Because one of the reasons that all Christians will sometimes feel like losers is because of a particular truth right at the heart of this passage, a particular reality that we face as believers, and it's this, that some will hate us because of what we believe. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We continue our series in the book of Revelation that we've just had read, a book that, as you know, offers suffering Christians hope for a hostile world. As Jesus speaks to these seven real churches that are meant to speak into the lives, not just of those historical churches then, but our lives and our churches today. 
And today's letter to Smyrna is a letter that is all about a church that is in severe persecution. They're being killed, arrested, imprisoned because they are Christians. If life were a game, then they were definitely losing. And straight away, we have to say that we live in a part of the world where severe persecution is frankly quite alien to us. Our experience over here is not normal. It's a map uh, on the screen. Uh, It shows us where persecution is most rampant uh, in the world. And the bottom line from that picture is that it's common. One in eight Christians, 340 million Christians face high levels of persecution and discrimination uh, for their faith. And COVID has made it worse. Food supplies in villages in some parts of the world simply don't get to you if you are a Christian. Uh, the, The rate of killing in Nigeria has tripled during COVID as people take advantage of lockdowns, the militia groups. And all of that on top of the fact that the average Christian lives on less than a dollar a day in normal times. For many people around the world, maybe some even tuning in right now, these words will be particularly relevant and precious. But even if we don't experience persecution or experience extreme poverty in that kind of way, these are our brothers and our sisters. And today reminds us of at least three things. It reminds us how to pray for suffering uh, Christians, those suffering persecution. It reminds us how to prepare for persecution. Because the the truth is that whereas in the past uh, Europe was filled with Christian faith, that is fast changing. In fact, on the next slide, it's similar one to the first one you saw from Open Doors. It, it, it lists Western Europe up there in the top uh, corner as an area of concern. And we have to be honest, if we're being open and honest with those around us uh, about what we believe, then there will be times when that becomes uncomfortable, even offensive for some. So it helps us to prepare, helps us to uh, pray, and it will help us to process our suffering too, suffering more generally. We, COVID has hit all of us hard in different ways, and many of us will have our own particular struggles as well. Uh, but perhaps if there is one thing to keep in mind as we go through this passage, one thing to take away, it's simply this, to live for eternal life, to keep in mind the reality of life and death, and to live for eternal life. Have a look down with me at this passage. We start in verse 8. Jesus says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, stop there, Smyrna. This city was known for its architecture and its idol worship, its architecture and its idol worship. My father-in-law was a chaplain in the Middle East, in Oman for many years, and some time ago now, he asked me to come out to the United Arab Emirates to encourage some of the churches there. One of those churches, uh, a few of them were in Dubai, And Dubai is a city that is also renowned for its architecture. Well, whether whether you call it good architecture or not is another matter, but it's certainly eye-catching. It's renowned for its architecture and wealth. And yet the church over there is small and restricted from sharing the gospel. In fact, the the day that we arrived, some Christians were put in jail uh, for flyering uh, leaflets about Christianity. And Smyrna was a little bit like that. It's the only city that uh, survives to the present day. It's called Izmir in Turkey today, third largest city there. And it, has, it had this famous street called the Street of Gold that curved around the top of this mountain that went up 500 feet uh, from the harbour. Uh, and, and as you looked at it, it was said to look 
like a necklace on the statue of a goddess. More commonly, it was known as the crown. So Dubai had the palm going out, man-made uh, island into the water. Smyrna had the crown. That's the architecture. What about the idolatry? Well, in 26 AD, it beat 10 other cities for the honor of building a temple to the, temple to the emperor Tiberius. In other words, worship of uh, Roman royalty was strong there. That's Smyrna. And Jesus says to this small church, in the midst of this godless prosperity, verse 8, to the angel of church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. In other words, I am the forever God. I am eternal. I was there before the Big Bang, before the first bacteria came into existence, and while dinosaurs and dodos have become extinct, I remain forever. And that matters to you because I'm the one who took on a human body and, verse 8, died and came to life again. In other words, I took on a human body and I grew up in it and I ate in it and I worked in it. I was put to death in it. But look, that body now lives forever by the power of an indestructible life. Here's the point, suffering Christians. Remember that your faith is grounded on my indestructible life. Just like I came back to life so that all who trust in me can, so that they can live forever, your faith is grounded on my indestructible life. What a hope to have when things seem hopeless. Now, for each of these churches as we go through, you'll know that there are three things to look out for, a pattern. There is a commendation, there is a correction, and there is a motivation. There's a, there's a commendation, there is something that the church is doing well, that Jesus says, keep going, I see. There's a correction, there's something they're getting wrong, a way that they're turning away from Jesus, something that they need to repent of. And then there's a motivation, something that is to keep them uh, trusting, a pointer to eternal life. But for Smyrna, the pattern changes. There is no correction. It, it seems that this is a church with no weaknesses at all. The other one is a church called Philadelphia we'll meet later in the week. And it's telling that these two churches were the two churches that were the least significant in terms of numbers and influence. Hear this. It is more important to be faithful than to be powerful. It's more important to be faithful than to be powerful. And to this faithful, suffering community, verse 9, Jesus says, I know. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. That word afflictions means extreme afflictions. That word for poverty means destitute. Isn't it striking that the things that Jesus commends as strengths are the very things that uh, as churches, we'd often think of tragedies and problems today, afflictions, poverty, slander. But when they're connected to faithfulness, Jesus says, I see, I know, well done. Well, what's been happening in this uh, city, in Smyrna, we're wonderfully helped uh, by early church history because in all likelihood, sitting in the congregation uh, would have been a man called Polycarp. We know lots about him because he grew up to be the Bishop of Smyrna, who was martyred in 160 uh, AD. And the record of his life tells us a lot about what was going on in this town. The church in Smyrna later recorded uh, that the Jewish community, they accused Polycarp of resisting state religion. Uh, he resisted the idol worship. He refused to worship uh, the emperor. The synagogue said that he, he teaches people not to sacrifice or to worship. So 
So this may well have been what was going on in Smyrna. Uh, the Christians would not join in with state religion. And because this religion was tied up with trade, it probably made it hard for the Christians to make a living. That's why they were poor. That's why they were destitute. Uh, and it also helps us with that phrase, they claim to be Jews, but are not. Now, it's not questioning their ethnicity. John himself uh, was a Jew. But their spirituality. Jesus is saying, look, you claim to be the people of God, but you engage in behavior that seems more in line with the devil, with Satan, with the person called the accuser in chapter 12. Because you are accusing the, the Jews who believe in Jesus, the Christians, before the Roman authorities. There was a, a large uh, Jewish population in Smyrna, and, and the Jewish community had a comfortable arrangement uh, with the Romans. And followers of Jesus, from a Jewish background most probably, would, would often been seen as part of that group. But now, these messianic Jews who trusted in Jesus were making a fuss about idols, and the synagogues wanted to distance themselves from them. And all of this landed the Christians in prison and persecuted. Perhaps the closest examples today would be compromising state churches, churches that, that claim to be faithful, but are uncomfortable when the, the members begin to go against the government and want to, they, the churches would want to distance themselves uh, from believers who did that. Uh, examples might be the Chinese state church. Well, you can be a believer, of course you can, but as soon as you disagree with what the government says, well, then we will distance ourselves from you. And sadly, some parts of the Church of England, you might say, are, are in danger of that here too. It's fine, you can believe, but, but if you go against the direction the government seems to be taking us in, well, then we might distance ourselves from you. And Jesus says, he knows. And in the midst of that, he offers comfort. See it in verse 9 as we look down again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. He's saying, in spite of this affliction that you're going through, God has given you a spiritual treasure chest, spiritual riches that are beyond your wildest dreams. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, even though he was struggling at the time, having nothing yet possessing everything. Now look, I've had to hang on to this truth myself as a, a member of the Church of England who's tried in the last uh, year to hold on and to articulate orthodox views, for example, on marriage at a national uh, level and received all kinds of abuse and calls for my uh, resignation. It's actually quite, quite funny because um, I'm not on social media that much, but, but around the time that all of this was happening, suddenly I got the calls started to come in. E e Jason, are you doing okay? Yeah, I think so. Email's coming in. E you doing okay? Well, it's just because of all that stuff on social media that's going on. So they've got, oh no. So, so if you're one of those people who sent the emails, thank you very much. But I, I, I wasn't actually someone who was uh, that engaged with it. But there was a lot of this stuff going on. And I needed to remember. I'm rich, I'm rich. As it says in the book of Ephesians, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ, chosen by the God of the universe, loved with a never failing love, adopted to be a child of the king, redeemed by the blood of the lamb, grace lavished on us, sealed with the spirit of the living God and a new family in the church, amen? Amen. Polycarp was arrested uh, for not burning incense to these uh, imperial gods. And he was invited. You, you can renounce your faith. We won't burn, we'll renounce your faith. We won't burn you at the stake. What did he say? He said, 86 years I've served him, Jesus, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme him? These riches were deep deeply felt in his soul, so that all he could see was blessing. 
But, but more than that, these troubles, will they actually increase our riches? You know, Paul puts it like this. He says, our light and momentary of troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Hear this. Troubles increase our riches. So friends, when you see suffering in your life or, or suffering in the life of others, it is making their experience, your experience of the new creation even better than it would have otherwise been. And I don't think any of us would begrudge that when someone who, for example, has been steamrolled literally for their faith is closer to Jesus than we are. Or someone who spent years in prison for their faith, in charge of more cities than we are. He knows our poverty, he knows our struggle, yet we are rich. But the fullness of those riches will have to wait. Notice he doesn't say that things are going to get better now. In fact, he says the opposite, verse 10. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Things are going to get worse. They're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Uh, he's talking, I think, there about the, the Romans who are, are going to put uh, these Christians in prison. And he says that they are going to suffer persecution for 10 days, and some will even die. Things are not going to get better in the short term. But the big thing I want us to see here about persecution, about suffering, is that it is limited. Do you see it says that they will suffer persecution for 10 days? There's a few different things that could mean those 10 days. It was the standard time that people were sometimes put in prison before they were sent into the arena as a gladiator to fight. And forget Russell Crowe, basically that meant certain death. But more likely, as we heard earlier in the week, it's symbolic. Symbolic for the fullness of the suffering that they would experience, but also that it was limited. That Jesus is in control. Christian, if trouble is going to get to you today, it is going to have to come through Jesus Christ. He's still in control, even through suffering. And when it's over, if we stay faithful, there is life, eternal life to come. Verse 10 again, you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as a victor's crown. So I said at the beginning, Smyrna actually had that famous golden street, city itself known as the crown. To be part of it was probably thought of as kind of making it, of having a real honor. That was what winning the game of life looked like. But Jesus says that the real crown is the permanent life given to faithful Christian, tears wiped away, bodies made new, crowns on our heads, seeing the brilliance of the face of Jesus forever. Verse 11, whoever hears, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Death may be coming, but the death to really fear is the day of judgment before God, the second death, the lake of fire as it's described in chapter 20. Jesus' point, if you are a believer, you have nothing to fear from that. Here's how Polycarp uh, put it when the Roman soldiers came to arrest him and burn him at the stake. He said, your fire lasts for a little while. The fires of judgment, though, cannot be quenched. The one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. Friends, what do we do with all of this? How does this cash out for us practically? Let me uh, start with four things. Number one. This helps to remind us how to pray for Christians who are persecuted around the world. 
in our life as a church, as I'm sure in uh, your churches, we pray regularly for persecuted Christians. As a family, we uh, receive the material from Open Doors and use that to help us pray as a family. We particularly like to use that at Christmas time. It's a time when uh, the world is so full of materialism, so full of uh, plenty. Just to remind ourselves of a family of what many Christians around the world are living like. When part of Jesus' body suffers, we all suffer. We feel helpless, but we can pray. And uh, Revelation chapter 2 gives us so much to pray about. At the beginning, we learned that Christ is with them. He's among his churches in the lampstands. We can pray, you're with them, Jesus. We've seen in verse 9, he knows what's going on. We can pray, Christ, you know. You know their struggle. And as we've seen in verse 10, we can pray, Christ, you promise life for those who continue to trust in you. Here's how that uh, worked uh, out in the life of some persecuted believers. I was reading a book called Dispatches from the Front by uh, a man called Tim Kesey. He travels around the world visiting uh, Christians who are suffering uh, in different places. He landed in Afghanistan, and hours uh, after he had landed, he heard of a woman called Gail who had been shot and killed as she walked to work. The Taliban had took credit for uh, the killing because they said that she was spreading Christianity. And as the believers met to worship that night, uh, their main prayer request, their main prayer request was that their agencies back home wouldn't make them leave. Here's what Tim wrote. He said they didn't want to leave because they had an unshakable belief that Gail stands in light her wounds healed by wounded hands, that she is safe, comforted, and home, and that as she would be buried the next day and a cross placed in the ground, a kingdom stake would be driven into the ground that caused the very gates of hell to shudder. They wanted to keep going because her life hadn't been in vain, she hadn't lost, and eternity lay ahead. We can pray, number one. Number two, we can prepare for persecution ourselves. We can prepare for persecution ourselves. We can remind ourselves that, that the life Jesus talks about here in verse 10 really is worth it. This is what winning at life really looks like. And I think we need to preach this to ourselves often. We are uh, into board games in my family. This is one that we particularly love. Ticket to, any Ticket to Ride fans here? Brilliant, brilliant. Well, look, catch me afterwards. I, we love this game as a family. And uh, uh, we, we play this game. I, I never win. I'm not sure I've ever won a ticket, which is quite impressive. I don't think I've ever won at this game, Ticket to Ride. But you know, you know how it is. You've got all the bits and so on. And at the end of the game, what happens? What do you do with these at the end of the game? You put them, you can speak. What do you do with them at the end of the game? You put them, you put them back in the box, don't you? And I think sometimes we need to remember that when it comes to our life here and now, that do you know what? At the end of the day, death is coming, and all of the trinkets, the things that we spend so much energy and time on, they're going to be snatched away. They're going to go back in the box. But you know what? The victor's crown, the crown of life, it will remain. Your tears will be wiped away. Your bodies will be made new. Crowns will be put on your heads. You will see the brilliance of the Lord Jesus Christ forever. And it's worth it. A friend of ours uh, announced some years ago now that she was going to marry a man who wasn't a Christian. She was a Christian, and she herself believed that this was not right to do. <laughs> My wife, who was a good friend of hers, spoke to her, and she had to say that we couldn't give her our blessing. She knew that there was a small group of friends. She knew that word would get round, so she emailed all of the other friends to say that she had had this conversation and to this day those relationships 
are fractured. And that was really hard for my wife. These were people she'd grown up with since school days. And she had to say to herself, do you know what? I cannot let my trinkets be more important than Jesus, because do you know what? One day they will go back in the box, but the crown of life will remain. Question, are we holding rightly, but lightly, to the things of this world? There are lots of priorities that we must rightly have, lots of things we must give our attention and time to this side of heaven. But do we hold them lightly too? Are we ready to give up if we have to or if we're forced to? We need to preach to ourselves that some of these things pale into insignificance compared to life with Jesus. For my uh, wife and I, it was reputation and respect. And we had to say to ourselves, this is nothing compared to life with Jesus. It's all going to go back in the box. What do your trinkets look like? Take a moment to think. Where do you need to remember to, to, to hold rightly, but lightly? to the things of this world. 11 years ago, we moved on to an estate in South, uh, sorry, not South, in central London, uh, a council estate to, to plant a church. In the last few years, every year there has been a, um, a murder uh, of a, a young person. And it would be easy for us to say, let's flee, let's go. And we have to keep asking ourselves, are we overvaluing long life? Because one day, it's going to go back in the box. And proclaiming Jesus matters. And God will give us far more in the life to come. Why do we need to remember this? Let me say it again. When, when these things are taken away, either by force or by circumstance or because it's our choice, because we want to make Jesus known, we will suffer. And let's not pretend that there will not be pain and sorrow. It may be great. We may shed many tears. Jesus shed many tears the night before he died. But if we have preached this to ourselves, when the day comes we will find ourselves better prepared to say, the thing that I value most in life is Jesus Christ. And when someone takes my trinkets away for the sake of Christ, I gain more of him. Let us prepare ourselves for persecution by remembering this. We can prepare. Number three. We can ask, how might I be compromising in order to avoid persecution at work or in society? How might I be compromising in order to avoid persecution at work or in society? Here are three surefire ways uh, to avoid persecution. Number one, to choose tolerance over truth. To choose tolerance over truth. To say, look, I give equal value to, to any and on, on all beliefs. You have your beliefs, I have mine. That's the main thing. That's number one. Just choose tolerance over truth. Number two, never say that there is only one way to God. Never say that. You believe your thing, I'll believe mine. Never say that there's only one way to God. Number three, just let your life and not your words be your witness. Let your life and not your words be your witness. I'll be nice, I'll smile at work, and maybe someday someone might ask me something. Now look, don't mishear me, being slow to speak can be a good thing. But it can be code for, I'm just going to live like the people around me. And if we do that, we will not suffer because there will be nothing that stands out about us. And all the while, our worldliness will contradict whatever claim we make for the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there could be a danger of being unkind and brash or, or unnecessarily awkward. But we need to ask ourselves, what is our tendency? Is it to be brash and unkind? Or is it to fit in? How 
how might I be compromising? And, third, and fourthly, finally, persevere. Persevere in suffering. No one knows that the sorrows that may meet us tomorrow, we, we simply don't know the hardships that God will call us to walk through. But, but even though uh, we don't know them, we can prepare for them. And most of us leave it too late. We've heard from Jonathan a, a, a wonderful book, Stories Can Help. Perhaps that book, Counting the Cost, might help us. Let me tell you one more. Noah Spivy is a young man who died age 17. He died of a rare bone cancer. He, he did a number of testimonies online. You can, you can find them. And one of the, the most famous ones shared the most. Uh, he, he said this line. He said, cancer sucks, but Christ is better. And that's a nice phrase. But as you, as you watch the video and hear him speak, you, you realize that he, this is something that he believes in the depths of his heart. And the reason that he could say that with such conviction was because he'd been saying it to himself for years and years and years. Make no mistake, it is a sad story. From a, a non-Christian perspective, he, he lost the game of life. But when it came to God's game, when it came to reality, he had won. Amen. He had won. Friends, our existence will not end in suffering and death although that will be part of our story this side of glory. But these things are a gateway to eternal life and to unending joy. And we need to keep preaching it to ourselves day after day after day. Let's bow our heads. a moment of quiet for reflection. Lord Jesus Christ, if in one unfortunate moment you took everything that we own, everything you've given from heaven above and everything that we've ever known, if you stripped away our ministry, our influence, our reputation, our health, our happiness, our friends, our pride and our expectations, if you caused for us to suffer or to suffer for the cause of the cross, if the cost of our allegiance was prison and all our freedoms were lost, if you take the breath from our lungs and make an end of our life, if you take the most precious part of me and take my kids and my wife, it would crush us, it would break us, it would suffocate and cause heartache. We would taste the bitter dark providence, but you would still preserve our faith. Would what is concealed in the heart of having be revealed in the losing of things, though many of us can't even begin to imagine the sting that kind of pain brings? Would, you never, would we never blame you for evil, even if you cause us pain? We came into this world with nothing, and when we die, it will be the same. Would we praise your name in the giving and taking away? Because if we have you, we could lose everything and still consider it gain. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, let's stand and let's respond. We're going to stand and we're going to sing um, It Is Well With My Soul. And it's a hymn that was written by um, a chap who lost most of his family um, at sea. So what was dearest to him had been taken from him. And yet he still wrote these words, It's well with my soul. It's well, it's well with my soul. And let's sing this and let's know that in Christ we have everything.
turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Coming through the storm Oh no, you never let go In every high and every low Oh no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me I can see the light that is coming For the heart that holds on A glorious light beyond all compare there will be an end to his troubles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you here on the earth, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me,
Well, as always, there is a prayer team that would love to pray with you if you would like to um, as a response to what you've heard um, from God's Word this evening. And that's through the bookstall. Um, there's a prayer space to my left or right. Um, and if you're in the relay tent, it's the same direction. Um, and if you're at home and you would like us to pray for something specifically, please do email us in at prayer at keswickministries.org and we will pray for you. Another opportunity to pray tomorrow morning at 8.45 in here, and it will also be live streamed. Well, let's pray as we close. O oh, our forever God, we give you thanks that you have dwelt amongst us this evening, that we have heard from your spirit what you are saying to your church. Again, we pray, help us to take to heart your word tonight, that you are the forever God. We long to be faithful to you, not powerful, not winning at life. And so prepare us to serve you faithfully with our eyes on sisters and brothers around the world, with our eyes on life with you, Jesus. Not trinkets, but the crown of life. And give us conversations, conversations tonight, conversations this week, to encourage us to that end, to persevere, for that blessed hope, blessed rest for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good night. of Christ the Lord, a tribe from every land, loved before the world began, our names are on his hands. We were promised long ago to weak and barren hearts, and here we stand.
stand as living proof as countless as the stars. We, the people of the cross, are mark of victory. For once we wore the chains of sin. Set free. We celebrate our suffering King who died to make us one. We were the prize, and in his eyes, the trophy he has won. We, the church of God, the gates of hell will not overcome, and we will see. His kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. We, the holy house of God, each gifted for the whole, and with the Spirit's help we'll strive to bring Satan cannot bear the sound of gospel news declared. We, the church of God, the gates of hell will not overcome, and we will see his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. As we approach the throne of grace with meeting hearts ablaze. Yes, we, the church of endless praise, are dwelling with our King. And hallelujah, God, we praise the skies. It is.